47.1. Bam, bam. Today's Easter, so you got two Jews talking about a third Jew, Jesus. Um, I just found out on NPR that like, for the first couple hundred years of Christianity, before you could become a Christian, you had to become a Jew, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, you had to be like Jesus, and Jesus was a Jew. And then they, they kind of relaxed the uh, requirements, and they got a lot more members. Because it, it, it was tough back then to, to do the Jew stuff. Possibly involved getting the end of your dick sliced off and such. I don't know anything about that. Um, obviously, if you were a polytheist and you ate, you know, un- you ate a lot of pork or shellfish, then you know, and and yeah, you shaved your beard. I mean, there were plenty of little things you could do to become more like a Jew, and. Uh, uh, the reason, I guess I do know something about that, the reason that the non-Jewish world, the, the Christian world, don't wear beards or don't have to, are able to uh, not have uh, kosher laws, uh, don't need to be circumcised, is because the Christians wanted to bring uh, Christianity to the uh, a wider public, and so they relax those rules. So yes, that is the reason. Very good, Rick. Okay, all right. But on you know the holiest day of the Christian calendar, we could talk about what it's like to be you know, Jewish in a largely Christian country. My experience of, of Christian rituals is we got all the boredom of Christianity without being entitled to the to the unconditional love of Jesus, which I guess makes it conditional, but still like, you know, like you know, growing up, Sundays were always, you know, the Christian's day and it was always boring and there was the TV, the stuff on TV was never the best. And, uh, you know, we got some of it. We got, uh, you know, I think more Jews, you know, engage in Easter rituals like coloring eggs and eating a bunch of candy than engage in, uh, than get Christmas trees, for instance. Okay. But um, just my experience of, of, of Christianity was, for the most part, growing up was like Sundays where you're a little bit stir crazy. Well, um, my response is that I love living in a Judeo Christian country. I think the American Christian is the best friend that you ever had. I think if it wasn't for American Christians, Israel would not have survived. Uh, and uh, I think that the we have more in common than we have uh, there's than we have as far as differences go. So to me, a religious Christian is an ally, not somebody that I feel uh, uh, opposed to in any way. I, I pretty much feel the same way. Plus, Jesus forgives Christians, so I came very close to making out with, um, actually did make out with um, Christians from time to time, even though Now the deal, like, it's, I mean, making out isn't really a sin, but sometimes it feels like a sin, especially if you're youngish, and I couldn't understand how somebody could make out with me and still have, like, a little cross around her neck, but it turns out that the deal is, like, Jesus forgives you, and so Christians can fool around, and I, I appreciated that one. I was the one chosen to be fooled around with. Well, here's an interesting thing. Most people don't know this. But there's no law in the Old Testament against having sex without marriage. Now, there may be something about fornication in the New Testament, but Jews are actually allowed to get it on before marriage. 
out, uh, outside of marriage. Oh. Uh, the, what Jews are not allowed to do is commit adultery or incest, uh, but we are allowed to... So, so there's, wait, there's so... Nothing, there's, there's nothing about... Uh, there's nothing about... Well, I just told you, right. So, so, so it's 200 B.C. Yeah. And Shumal can have sex with Rivka and without, and they're not married to each other and they don't get a visit from the Rebbe? Well, there are a couple of things that are not in the Bible that are actually cultural. And people get confused because they think that, they think something is a religious sin when it's actually just a cultural sin. So I do get a visit from the Rebbe? No, just listen to me. Okay. Um, because you have to get this right if you're a single guy. <laughs> um, you, all right, you're the, there's nothing in the Old Testament preventing you, that Old Testament meaning the Jewish Bible, from having sex outside of marriage. It's just not mentioned. Two, Lesbianism is not mentioned in either Bible. So technically, lesbians have not committed any sin. There's no, there's nothing, there's no mention of it. Is it possible? To there's mention of gay sex. Yeah. But male, male on male. Now, let me ask you, is it possible that since the Bible was both the old and the new, were most, it was mostly, it was almost entirely compiled by dudes? Is it possible that the dudes were so clueless that they didn't even take lesbianism into account? That they were like, yeah, like, that they didn't even think that women would be into it, so they just ignored it? You know, it's a funny thing. Um, it, lesbianism does seem to be all the rage these days, <laughs> but um, I, I doubt it. Uh, I think that I think it may not have been, there are some things that just aren't worth put making a law about. Uh, I mean, because you, you can bet they had it back then. I mean, you know, it had to have occurred, so can they would have that, known about it. Can you hold that thought? I'm going to cut. Rolling! We're back. Okay, so when we left off, lesbianism's cool in the Bible because it's not just, it's not mentioned at all. Correct. Not mentioned at all, so... Is there any implied... Wait, I, no, wait, I had, I had more to say about that. But hold on, is there any, like, like when... when uh, I know of no stories of lesbianism in the or, Bible. Or just like what companionate, like, marriage-type deals were... Uh, who's, uh, like, the Book of Ruth or something, where Ruth hangs out with... I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a stretch. Okay. I, I don't think there is any mention of it. But, um... Uh, there was a point I wanted to make about it, and that is that um, uh, the the reason that people this is a very important thing about religion people mistake cultural uh, customs yeah. for thinking that something's in the Bible, and one of the reasons, for example that sex before marriage is always, in almost every society, it's discouraged. And the reason is because a lot of these uh, cultural taboos began 200 years ago when we lived in agrarian societies. And if you were living in a society where there were only 400 people, and you're you were going to be married off to Master Billy at the other side of the village, then you'd be really causing trouble if you started secretly making it with Master Ebenezer, you know? So they, they, it was a way of creating order in their village uh, or, their, or their agrarian uh, countryside. And today, we don't have that kind of situation. So there's really no reason why you have to wait to have sex. No, there's no, there's nothing in the 
in the Old Testament about it. You the, could argue that the it's Buddhists good. don't care about it, uh, and we don't. We don't. We're not. Our parents don't pick. People don't realize how common it was for parents to pick the uh, the the marriage part, the spouse of the of the children. Uh, but we don't do that anymore. So we're actually allowed to have sex more often than we think we are. Um, I believe in the Christian Bible there's something about fornication, but I'm no expert on Christian uh, taboos. Camille, do you know if Christians are permitted, are, is there a real verse in the Bible that says thou shalt, in the Christian Bible, in the New Testament, you know, that you're not allowed to have sex unless you're married? Oh yeah, it's called fornication, premarital sex. Yeah, all right. Well, it's not in the Jewish Bible. There is Should no we use this to segue over to it's weird that, you know, on this holiest of Christian days that uh, we have one of the, we have a super fakey Christian president. Uh -huh. Now, I'm sure we've had other presidents in the past who've, you know, all presidents have, you know, have, have claimed to be Christian, mm -hmm. and, but they've, they've been, had various degrees of, well, actually, I don't know, I think probably some of the earlier presidents were deists rather than full-on Christians. Oh, God, you believe that left-wing crap. I don't know, I mean, the, 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 the further forward you go in history, the more powerful is atheism. The further back, the more, the more people believe in traditional God. Okay, but now you've got a guy who talks about two Corinthians, and you know, he's, his Christianness is not convincing. Let me ask you a question, just out of curiosity. Are you... This is the thing that bothers me, okay? I hated Obama and Clinton because of their policies. Yeah. Do you actually give a flying, a flying fudge what the religious beliefs are of Trump? Well, I wanted to talk about this last week, but we ran out of time. Where is it? That's the question we should be asking each other. Where, you know, we have... As president, we have a rapscallion, a cad. Yet, and so is that a big deal? Uh, because, I mean, he is promoting policies that a lot of people like. And does it matter that he is morally not the best? Well, I, you know, if we're talking about him cheating on his wife, there, there wouldn't, there would hardly be any American presidents. Oh, you could go through a bunch of them, and some, yeah, yeah some I mean, did, some the did. whole thing is ridiculous. Well, except that he's, I mean, the way he's cheated is, is, is. Anyway, are you kidding? JFK and Lyndon, even it turns out Lyndon Baines Johnson, I know. He, he, and 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 Clinton were turned the White House into a brothel. I mean, it, it's crazy. Now, all of a sudden, you, you know, no, well, that's, you, that's you, Mr., Mr. Let's have as much transgenderism as possible. You're all upset because uh, the, the, the moral rectitude of the president is, be, is, is, is not in line with your, your, your fundamentalist beliefs. Well, that's what we're, we're going to argue about right now. Okay, Which well, if you're okay with it, no, well, and no, I'm no, okay no. with it, then who are we worried about? Well, the deal you're is... You're just trying to... You told right. me last week that you don't give a crap about his morals. You just are trying to peel off a few votes from his base. Well, no, let's talk about... Which, is, which to me is disingenuous. I don't know. I just admitted it. But let's talk about that. You because, admitted it because everybody but, knows it. But and, it and they've been... CNN and has been interviewing fundamentalist Christians, and they keep saying they don't care. Nope. They like him because of his policies. You know what? You know what? It, even if he was, uh, no matter what religion he is, he's good for Christianity, so they're for him. Well, all right. Christ evangelicals were not a pol were not mobilized as a political force until the eighties, um, and so 
you know, the, the, the idea of judging from an evangelical point of view wasn't a political issue um, you know, until, the, for, until the last few decades. And now you've got a guy who just has a lot of, who has blatantly, you know, been sleazy. He cheated on his wife. That's what no, he, he did. No, he did a bunch of other stuff. Cover a Playboy and just all this other, and bragging about you know the the girls he banged and and having pretending to be somebody else or actually claiming on Marla Maples' behalf what a good lay he was and just stuff like that. But you know, in his private life before he was a politician, but you know, just kind of like doing you know being on Stern all the time. Um, bragging yeah, on that these stuff. Are not, these but are no, but not. The deal is, these but, aren't like mortal sins, Rick. No, but they are kind of like. You can get it on and still be Christian. Uh, yeah, but he really. I mean, it, it's. Who cares? Well, what, I know what, I'm what, asking. I mean, he's not is, your pastor. But, but, I mean, if, no, but if here's you were, how it, here's if how you were it, in Tennessee. Here's how it feels. Yeah. It feels like uh, politics has become, on both sides, a rather than an issue-based thing, to, to some extent, it's, it's, it's like a team thing. Like you're for the Patriots or you're for the Broncos. And their behavior doesn't matter, is, is less important than, than the winning is. That's just the way Democrats look at it. Well, no, it looks like the evangelicals look at it the same way, where you look at that, take that statistic where... Ten years ago, um, 70% of, of evangelicals surveyed said that a politician's personal behavior mattered to them. Yeah, they and, found out they were wrong about it. And that. now it's down to 20%. Yeah, because they found out, guess what? Given, you know, given a, a guy like Obama who, who was you know, too scared of Michelle to cheat on her, or a guy like Trump that gives you what you want but cheats, they'll take Trump like reasonable people. Sorry, Rick. I har I'm, I'm sorry this is hard for Democrats to comprehend. Well, you, what you're but saying what is... Fundamentalists are smart enough to vote based on policy. Think about that. Maybe they're more sophisticated than the, than the straw-chewing, uh, corncob pipe-smoking, gun-toting, Bible-thumpers than you think they are. That's not one or the other. No, that's exactly what's happening. You don't credit fundamentalist Christians in the middle of the country with having as much sophistication as people in New York and L.A. You're just as prejudiced as all the other Democrat hierarchy. You don't realize that they can look at the situation and say, okay, Trump is doing good things for the economy. He's helping Israel. He's good on foreign policy. Yeah, he has sex with his wife. If he starts a church, I'm not going to it. I'll let him be my president. Well, I, I kind of base some of this, like, when I think that a big part of his base is not sophisticated. Then you're wrong. You're just a bigot. No. I mean, I, I, I base it on, like, no, Twitter's not everything, but I read the the quality of discourse and the quality of grammar and the quality of everything in terms of writing that comes out of the conservatives on Twitter that are just, I mean, there are more typos, more misspellings, less grammar. This is and anecdotal. Also there, this is anecdotal. Every study, yeah. let me tell you what the best studies show. The best studies show that liberals uh, have higher levels of degrees and years in college. Yeah. But that Republicans can answer more questions, conservatives get more questions right on general knowledge qu uh, uh, tests. So that, that I would go, I would, so the, the liberal is more educated, the, Republican, the conservative knows more. What are they being tested on? The, just general knowledge, who the, you know, the capitals, what, who's the president of this country, what, you know, what ha which, who were the sides in World War II. And you can look that up. There's no. Well, let's do it on break. Okay, but the point is, is that there's no proof whatsoever that liberals are smarter than conservatives. That's absurd. 
Well, there is statistical stuff and survey stuff that says that uh, Trump's base con is consists of a higher proportion of low information voters. Yeah, and it's, it's and that it's Fox the, viewers get more stuff wrong than viewers of other channels. No, that's that sounds like pure propaganda to me. Uh, well, it's it's more for the break. We'll look up stuff. I don't even think it's worth it to be honest with you. What's your point? Who cares? Well, the, you just accused me of of thinking that that conservatives are all chewing on hay. Yes. And, and you just said that you have good reason to believe that. Well, the, statistically, the, according to surveys, the, the Trump base has more low information voters than... No, no, you, we can look that up, but I, frank, I find it dull, but we can look it up because you're interested in IQ and stuff like that. You like this kind of thing, so that's fine. You want to knock yourself out, let's look it up. Okay, when we break. All right. You're saying that this is like a, some kind of higher order of knowledge, or evangelicals are smart enough to... Anyway, we go on from here, do you want to talk about something else? Um, you said you wanted to talk about how Jews view Jesus? Well, I mean, I, I said that, that we, we, have, we have to deal with all the... As Jews, we... We have to sing Christmas carols and such like, and like that, but we won't get the unconditional, we don't get the love of Jesus because we haven't accepted him as our savior. There are two views on that. The, um, there are certain fundamentalist groups that believe that if you don't accept Jesus, you're damned to hell. Uh, you're not saved. There, but more recently, the Vatican of all organizations uh, released a, I believe it's a missive or whatever, uh, uh, stating that their new policy is that you don't go, Jews don't go to hell just for being Jews. Didn't the Vatican just this week say, or didn't the Pope say there is no hell or something like that? Uh, I don't know what this Pope does because I think he's a kook, but I know that... that he, no, that he's an ex bouncer he can't be a kook. In one of the... Um, in one of the, uh, like, it was about 15, 20 years ago, the what? Catholic Church changed its policy on whether Jews are going to Wait, hell. Why do you think this Pope's a kook? He seems like a good guy. Well, because he's, he can't figure out whose side to be on, the Palestinians or the Jews in Israel. Like, he thinks both sides are equally wrong. And to me, that, that shows a, a dangerous... Uh, inability to uh, to judge uh, morally. He's also he's very excited about global warming. He thinks that's a very big deal. Um, Which it kind of is. Well, the thing is, he just strikes me as being a, a, so he, he's, a he's a dangerous leftist. You mean, so a guy so a guy who believes in established, I don't want to argue about global warming, but a guy who believes in, in strongly established science is a kook he's he's made he's made a number of okay i can tell you this all right not being an expert on this pope i know for certain that if you go over uh, he's made many statements about capitalism being a real problem and and creating uh greed and and poverty which is he's very strongly leftist He's anti-Israel. He's uh, he's you know he's he, he's I don't like his stance on global warming, but but more than anything, he's very leftist uh, in his economic beliefs. He thinks he thinks that capitalism is is one of the big problems in in the world, and so uh, but but in general. You, I don't know as much about his policies, but I'm certain that if you look up his beliefs, you would find that he's very, very leftist. He's, he's well, he comes from South America, which isn't exactly... I mean, that's a pretty, you know... It's not ex the most capitalistic continent in the world. Well, I mean, the, the problem with South America is that it's run by corruption and oligarchy. Uh, it's it's strongly based on families, uh, and and uh, you know bribery 
and and so as a result they don't have the tradition of people being able to rise from the bottom to the top uh, there's a lot of dividing up the wealth between wealthy families a lot of corruption a lot of bribery and as a result a lot of people from South America think that if they could just have a revolution that it's capitalism that's the problem and so they bring in this leftist these leftist leaders yeah, and they that, turn out to be lousy. that that turn out to be lousy so so the they the problem is, is that capitalism with 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 good laws and and fair opportunities has not been tried in South America very much so that's the problem there all right what else do you want to talk about well, you said you wanted to know what the official po positions of the religions are on Jesus because it's our, this is our Easter show. Okay, go ahead. All right. As you all know, uh, Jews don't worship Jesus. I have a personal belief about Jesus, which I'd like to share. Okay. Um, I think that Jesus falls into the category of a bodhisattva. Um, in, in the Hindu religion and in, in, among the Buddhists, there is a belief that a person can come to the earth that is a fully realized sort of spiritual being that has attained a certain uh, incredibly high level spiritually and they're they they're called bodhisattvas and they're not exactly gods they're they're humans they're as enlightened as you can get they're, yeah enlightened. yeah there is they're like the buddha they're 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 enlightened to the point where they have certain magical powers uh, and they actually are so wise that you you can follow them as a path to God. They they can be your uh, they can become your philosophy. Like you you know people could say, well, what do you believe in? Are you you know you could say, well, I follow this particular bodhisattva, and he actually comes to you in your dreams, or he uh, he becomes your way to to attain enlightenment. And so my theory is that Jesus Christ was one of these beings. And in, if he was doing the exact same thing in India, they wouldn't have made a religion around him. They would have just said he's a bodhisattva, and they would have followed him. They'd, there'd be a temple for him and a shrine where you could, you could pray to him. But he would, be, he would have a different character than the Jesus we know uh, today because the tradition in the West was you're either mes the Messiah or you're not. Um, my other belief is more spiritual. And this belief came to me while I was studying uh, Buddhism. Uh, I, I guess I should talk about this on camera. I spent... Uh, several years studying Buddhism in a kind of retreat where I fasted and prayed and meditated and observed a vow of silence for a very long time. Just so you know what you're Oh, okay. So anyway, um, and during that time, I got the insight, which you get insights when you're doing that. And my insight was that Jesus is actually the story of all of our lives that he's he's not so much it's not so much a historical character as he is sort of the story of all of us that we sort of go through his experiences as as we progress we we get crucified we crucify others that it's more he's more of a blueprint than he is a historical record and whether he actually existed or not is sort of beside the point. Um, that what matters is that you, you have a divine spark within you and that to the people that love you, you are 
in a way their Messiah and to the people that you punish you are their crucifier so there are um, three views two mine and one the official Jewish position uh, about the, the identity of Jesus okay let me come back with stuff um, you're, you're saying Jesus is one of the that occasionally somebody comes along who makes a persuasive case for the role of what human values and transcendent values should be in our lives for what ethic what an ethical model of, of a model of what an ethical person should be okay. a highly developed model right okay like Buddha had a model Jesus had a model I'm not disagreeing with you okay so that's going to be needed I believe more than ever as we move into the future in that we are going the what that as we combine with our devices and build devices of increasing sophistication we're going to things are going to become more and more complicated and potentially confused you know it's that whole robot girlfriend thing that i keep bringing up where we are going to need models of ethical behavior towards thinking feeling beings of the models will have to be of increasing sophistication because thinking feeling beings will be of increasing sophistication are you against abortion in the third trimester more or less I mean, okay. well, they do, because let's talk. I mean, the reality of third trimester abortions isn't, for the most part, somebody at 32 weeks says, Gee, "You know, I don't really want this baby. Let's. I want to get rid of it now, eight months in." Yeah, but if they, if it was, mm -hmm. would you try to stop it? Well, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and obviously, I'm asking the question because you have infinite concern for a robot. Uh, girlfriends, well, but, no, but, but I'm trying to figure out if you have the same concern for, you know, other kinds of humans. Well, I mean, most third trim, almost all third trimester abortions are the doctor comes to you and says, you know, your baby is anencephalic. Your baby does not have a brain; it just has a brain stem. Or your baby is missing two chromosomes. Or if you have the baby, you will die, and so will the baby. We got to get, you know, it, it's mostly no, nobody. There's not any. There's no organized movement of any kind among any conservatives that says that we should keep the baby alive and let the mother die. Right. I've never I, heard of such a thing. No, but I'm, I'm saying that when it's a third trimester abortion, it's usually because there's some tragic medical necessity. Yeah, but sometimes it isn't. Well, in that case, I mean, if it's... Are, are you for... What if, it, what if the baby has Down syndrome? Like, you find out that in the womb it has Down syndrome. Would you abort that baby? Well, you should find out about that earlier. What if you don't? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. So we, we should abort Down syndrome babies? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you find out you've got a Down syndrome baby uh -huh. in week eight... Or I don't know how soon they can do amniocentesis and all that stuff, um, but yeah, if you want to get, if you, it should be if you find out in week eight or week twelve, it should be up to you if you want to bring, you know, because that's a huge obligation, and it, it's a it's a lifelong obligation, and Down syndrome people, they have shorter lifespans, they have all sorts of medical problems, um, if, if ten weeks in. You don't want to carry a, a Down syndrome kid to term. I think you should be allowed that choice. Well, I have to admit, I do believe in, in abortion in the first trimester. Yeah. So I'm so, sort of just throwing this out there yeah, for you. Yeah. And I don't care. I, I, my reasoning as to when you should or shouldn't be able to do it doesn't matter because I believe in it. Uh, but I'm just saying, you've got such incredible concern about the feelings of these robot girlfriends. Well, it's not just robot girlfriends. Not, they don't even exist no, yet. No, but the deal is we will combine with, we will, robot girlfriends aside, there will be people walking around 40 years from now with augmented 
information processing capabilities. Some built in, some add-ons. It's not just artificial intelligence, it's people combining with, with increased computational, perceptual, information processing ability. It's, we're going to be when, facing... When, when did this become such a big concern for you? I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be mean to you, but this is, we're supposed to be open about what we think, and I just don't know why any of this matters. Well, because the future, a lot of aspects of the future are inevitable. And if you don't address the ethical aspects of the changes that civilization is the, the proliferation of, of what the proliferation of powerful information processing will do to civilization, you risk, I mean, it, things are going to be weird and effed up anyway. And we should be thinking about this stuff ahead of time. To pretend that it's not going to happen is to be unprepared. All right. And so one what, way to what, be prepared yeah, right. is so to... You're, you're the one that's given it the most thought, probably, of anybody on Earth. What do you think we should do, Rick? Well, most ethical systems start from something like the golden rule. That we each value our own feelings and we build bridges to others by imagining that they have similar feelings and would want to be treated with the same right. so everybody knows the question is do do robots have feelings or well, these, and when you say an augmented human well it's who cares i mean it's a, an augmented human's a human yeah but if, if civilization, if big chunks of civilization end up being ruled by augmented humans who are much smarter than regular humans and who form syndicates of thought, groups of thought, and they're, it's like you know, individual investors in the stock market versus computer trading. It's become clear over the past 30 years that just individual investors get effed over by machine trading, that they, machine, the computerized trading that's able to trade within a couple thousandths of a, thousandths of a second based on algorithms, a, a, you know, a program that's able to execute 300 trades in two seconds to take advantage of, of you know, moves of an eighth of a cent each time. That kind of stuff makes it tougher for individual investors. And similarly, if the world becomes dominated by augmented humans and, and groups of humans who are highly linked through, you know, at, at basic levels of, of thought, or people who have, are in league with AIs, those people may out, and beings may outstrip normal humans, and you need ethical systems to protect everybody in that deal. I mean, up till now, all humans have had roughly the same levels of ability. You know, the, the, you know most humans fall within, in terms of height, for instance, most humans, adult humans, are between four foot six and seven feet tall. So they don't vary, humans don't vary by, in height by more than 50%. And you could probably argue that, you know, in terms of intelligence, that's a, a rough guide too. That humans don't vary in intelligence by more than, you know, for the most part, by more than 50%. You know, you have to have some people whose IQs are 70, you have some people whose, whose IQs are 170. But, it's a pretty tight range. But what happens when people's abilities start spreading across a huge range? You know, it, it, IQ is a terrible way to talk about intelligence, but just for the sake of, you know, what happens when you have people with the equivalent of 800 IQs and they're in charge of stuff? What happens to people with just normal IQs? You need ethical systems to 
protect everybody and value everybody. And so we're going to need a whole bunch of, of modern, how do you say it, bodies, whatever, Jesuses. And bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas. People who've, who are able to think effectively about how to make the world a good place for everybody. All right. Well, and also you talk about capitalism. Um, the, the track record of capitalism is not, I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens with capitalism, but it outs the good and progress done within a capitalistic framework probably outstrips the bad done by capitalism. I had a, I had a weird conversation with somebody uh, where they were shocked, uh, socialists, and they were shocked that I said that capitalism builds wealth, and that no, no other system does that. And they got so angry and insulting that I, I cut them off, but uh, all you have to do is look at China. I mean, it, it's the perfect example. China is a communist country, tries to practice socialism, brings nothing but poverty. As soon as they switch over to capitalism, 20 years later, they're competing with us. And, and wealth has gone up dramatically. I mean, you don't need any more proof than right there. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to argue with you I'm about... I'm not saying you should argue. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's astonishing that we have a real example of, of capitalism creating wealth, in, and nobody, none of the liberals seem, you know, interested in that. So I'm, I'm not interested in arguing about contemporary capitalism or capitalism over the past 200 years. But I am interested in saying that the next 150, 200 years will may be, ex well, it'll lead to whatever it lead, whatever the next couple centuries bring, it won't be pure capitalism. Because capitalism in its purest form is a, is a, exists within the framework of the Industrial Revolution. And we're about to have all sorts of other revolutions. Biotech, information processing, all this stuff, and the speed of transactions and what things contain value is, will change. And whatever systems become, are most effective um, in the future won't be the form of capital in the form of capitalism that we're used to now. Well, you know, I get in arguments with Marxists about things like this because they like to play with the definition of what capitalism is, what socialism is, and to me, capitalism has only meant one thing, and that is freedom of trade, free, freedom of interference with the government in your pursuit of happiness, freedom from the government coming in and, and reorganizing your life or your, your possessions. So I'm, I, to my mind, capitalism goes back to the beginning of, of human history. So anyway, yeah. so but what... Do you, unless you have something to say. Well, I'm we just saying a, that, like, that, that what survives in a, in a weird future, which is inevitable, will have some capitalistic aspects, and then we'll have some aspects that are going to be new and not necessarily purely capitalistic. Well, what would they be? I mean, you're, you're holding forth on this. Well, I don't, I mean, it's something we need to start thinking about. Like, the, it, it, 
there are all sorts of, there are various dimensions to it. For instance, I've read, and now I've never been able to find the source after, again, that gold relative to the buying power of gold now compared to 2,000 years ago is much less because there's more stuff that can carry value. You know, back then gold and who knows, salt and whatever, property. Tulips. Yeah. Um, in the future, there'll be all sorts of other stores of value. And some of those stores, the value will like flow through them at some crazy accelerated rate. Okay. And that's going to make for different markets. And there'll have to be a way to protect beings who can't compute as fast as other beings from being economically exploited. And that's just one or two dimensions of, of the weirdness that we're going to face. All right. Well, I'm not going to argue with you about that. It might, it might not. So, uh, you want a break? Yeah, and then we'll let's come take back a break and, and, and have a new topic. All right.